just take a small commercial break tonight. And the reason for this is uh, so many people have been asking about the possibility of getting more extensive materials on the book of Revelation that uh, they've become aware were available. And I thought just to simplify things, let me just explain tonight uh, just a little bit, a couple of minutes, and then we won't talk about it anymore from the front. And you can inquire from my wife or myself when you see us after the meeting or, or around. Um, did have the opportunity to create this set of materials here. These are audio cassettes. And it covers the entire book of Revelation from beginning to end, the seals, the trumpets, the battle of Armageddon, and so forth. The material we're covering during this week is about 10% of the materials on these uh, audio cassettes. They were done in a studio, so they're compact and uh, carefully put together. And uh, I guess the good news is that a year ago, these sold in Australia for 300 Australian dollars, 45 hours of material. Thanks to the US dollar's current woes, they're available, shipping included, for just 200 New Zealand dollars. And uh, that, it would have been nearly double a year ago, so that's a, that's a blessing that has come in that way. So if this interests you, uh, these are audio cassettes, about 45 hours of material covering four seminary courses on the book of Revelation, and they're done in a form that is easy to understand. No one has ever sent them back because they were too heavy. So they, they cover the material lightly and uh, carefully, and uh, people have enjoyed it. I believe there's been uh, quite a few of these circulating in New Zealand already. So just enough of commercials, but uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, secure, I think uh, two possibilities. One is cash. The other is a check written out to North New Zealand Conference. So uh, either of those would be options. And Anyway, enough for the information. And now we get to our meeting for the evening. The sanctuary in the book of Revelation. What is the purpose of the sanctuary? The purpose of the sanctuary is to give the big picture of salvation. Salvation comes in small pieces throughout the Bible. But nowhere in the Bible is is sort of a global theology of, of salvation given, except in the sanctuary. And so a study of the sanctuary is an area that Seventh-day Adventists have been invited very strongly to be part of the message of the remnant. You see, when we looked at Revelation 10, we're to be a people of the gospel, which will be our subject tomorrow night, by the way. We're talking about the judgment and the gospel. All right, the gospel... Daniel Revelation Sanctuary. This is the heart of the message that we are to give to the world. That is a double challenge here. First of all, many people say, how can Adventists make the sanctuary doctrine central to their faith? It's an Old Testament teaching. The New Testament knows very little of the Adventist sanctuary doctrine. In fact, some would say, not at all. Most of Adventist teaching on the sanctuary tends to come from the Old Testament. So it's, it's a valid concern. And we want to ask the question, is it a New Testament doctrine, or are we taking an Old Testament teaching and imposing it on the gospel? Fair question. A second challenge is what does the sanctuary mean in the book of Revelation itself? And not everybody's convinced that the book of Revelation contains information on the sanctuary. In fact, I had the privilege of reading a paper on the sanctuary in the book of Revelation for the Society of Biblical Literature. And uh, there was a respondent. The Society of Biblical Literature has about 5,000 members, and they teach uh, New Testament and Old Testament at places like Harvard and uh, UCLA and uh, Stanford and so forth, uh, all all the top universities in the country. There are perhaps 100 Seventh-day Adventists that are members of this society as well. But basically, it's the mainstream uh, university scholarship about the Bible. And so it was a privilege to deliver 
this message about the sanctuary in the book of Revelation. Now, they gave a respondent, and they like to give respondents who tend to disagree with you. And the fellow who, uh, who responded to me started out talking about Charlie Brown lying on his back in the grass, looking up at the clouds and seeing duckies and horsies in the clouds. And he says, as I read this paper, I thought of Charlie Brown seeing the duckies and horsies in the clouds. In other words, to him, there was nothing to it. How would I respond to that response? How would you respond? What I said to that group, a mixed group, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, atheists, secular, and so on. What I said to them is, my respondent grew up in a denomination that believed that New Testament Christians were totally disinterested in the sanctuary, in the temple, and, and all that is involved with that. I grew up in a denomination for which the sanctuary is central to the message. Now the issue here is, which of these perspectives is faithful to the New Testament? I believe that New Testament writers were interested in the sanctuary. And the book of Hebrews is an obvious example. And I suggest to you that my paper tonight shows the book of Revelation falls into that same category. Now, interestingly enough, three of the top five scholars in the world on the book of Revelation were there listening to that paper. And when it was done... I quietly sought out each of them and asked their opinion of this subject and what I had presented. And I spoke to uh, an Anglican, and his response was, terrific, fantastic. He says, I loved it. I think it's right on. Then there was a Roman Catholic lady, and I asked her what she thought of it. She says, oh, she says it was beautiful. She says, I agree with every bit of it. And then there was another Roman Catholic lady the number one scholar in the world on Revelation today. And I asked her what she thought of it, and she said, I thought it was a very interesting Adventist reading of Revelation. (laughs) She knew too much. (laughs) She happened to have been my external examiner uh, for my doctoral dissertation and uh, had studied up quite a bit on Adventists uh, in preparation for that. But the basic message I received was that the top scholars in the world found the material I'm going to share with you tonight to be essentially credible, even though some with denominational bias might not see anything there. So what I'm going to share with you has been tested at the very highest level of scholarship. And therefore, I think this is something we can sink our teeth into and teach to others with confidence. In order to rightly come at the book of Revelation, I think we ought to start with what is explicit. Explicit means the things that are obvious. Implicit means things that are kind of hidden. They're there, but they're hard to find. Explicit means the obvious things. Let's start with the explicit pattern of the book of Revelation. Let's take the structure of the book and see if the sanctuary plays any role in all of this. In the book of Revelation, if you want to structure the book, there's a basic aspect that you've got to start with, and that is the four series of seven. You're familiar with that? The churches, the seals, the trumpets, the plagues. If you're going to structure the book of Revelation, you have to start there, because these are fairly obvious. You have seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Now, if you structure the book in that way, what you immediately begin to notice is that just before each of these visions is an introductory passage. Uh, One scholar suggests it's a stage backdrop for the activity of the visions. So before each of the visions, you have kind of a stage backdrop. And do you know where that stage backdrop comes from? In every case, it's the sanctuary. Revelation 1, 12 to 20, Jesus is walking among what? The candlesticks. That's a sanctuary image. In Revelation 4 and 5, we see the heavenly sanctuary with some of its furnishings and incense and worship and praise. 
Before the seven trumpets is a vision of the altar of incense. And the seven bowls are preceded by a vision of glory in the sanctuary and angels coming out of the sanctuary in heaven. So each of the four sevenfold series in Revelation is preceded by an introduction that says something about the sanctuary. And we're going to take a closer look at those introductions in a moment. But let's finish our structure of Revelation. It's one of the most controversial aspects of scholarship today on Revelation, Adventist, non-Adventist, whatever, is how is the book supposed to be structured? Well, in between the trumpets and the bowls, there's some material in chapters 12 through 14 that we could call the Great War or the Last War, the battle between the remnant and the dragon. Is there a sanctuary introduction at the beginning of this vision? Think for a minute. Revelation 11:19 has a view of the Ark of the Covenant. You say, wait a minute. How can 11:19 be an introduction to 12 through 14? It's in the wrong chapter. Well, guess what? The chapters in the Bible aren't canonical. If you go back to the earliest biblical texts, there are no chapter divisions and no verse divisions. Did you know that? Those were put in much later. The chapters around the 7th century, the verses at the end of the Middle Ages. So those are not inspired. In fact, did you know that the earliest manuscripts didn't have punctuation either? So the commas and the periods and the colons are all interpretations. Did you know that there weren't even spaces between words? in the original manuscripts. So there are times when that flow of letters could be read in more than one way, which explains a text like Revelation 22, 14. Have you ever wondered about that one? Some Bibles say, blessed is he who does his commandments, that he may enter into the tree of life, that he may eat of the tree of life and enter into the city. And what does the other translation say? Blessed is those who wash their robes, how do you get from keeping the commandments to washing the robes? Well, in the Greek, they're almost identical. It's where you break up the words. So sometimes there's room for interpretation in some of these things. Revelation 11:19 is a view of the heavenly sanctuary that precedes chapters 12 through 14. By the way, you've all perhaps seen that famous uh, example of this. If somebody writes down, God is now here, and writes it down without spaces, how could you also read that? God is nowhere. <laughs> you see? So this is a, a reason why scholars sometimes get gray hairs early. You see, because there are things that people say, I've read it in my English Bible, I've read it in my Maori Bible, I've read it in my French Bible, and it's clear. But they may not realize that sometimes there are layers of interpretation between the original text and the translation. What do you do with that, by the way? If you don't know Greek and Hebrew, how do you handle that problem? I'd suggest by using a variety of translations wherever you have that available to you. And in English, you do. You have 30, 40, 50 translations. If you compare a text in a variety of translations, you begin to see which translations tend to wander off into the, into the sunset sometimes. And you begin to get a sense of the biases that come in translations at times. So for those of you who would like to go deeper in your Bible study, I'd encourage you to do that. And my wife has a Bible that has four translations side by side. So anytime she's studying a text, she can see how it's done in several different forms. That's, that's a way to go deeper in your Bible study. Well, let's finish up here. The millennium, chapters 19 and 20, is preceded by 19, 1 to 10. And in 19, 1 to 10, you actually have a vision of worship that is almost identical to 4 and 5. They're very, very similar. So uh, this also appears 
to be a sanctuary piece, although there's no furniture there. In 19, 1 to 10, there's no furniture. But otherwise, you have 24 elders, you have four living creatures, you have worshiping crowds, and so forth. It sounds just like 4 and 5. So that would be the introduction there. Finally, the New Earth passage is introduced in chapters 21, 1 to 8 by some material talking about the tabernacle of God. So, if you look at the explicit pattern in the book of Revelation, you see seven visions preceded by seven introductions. And each of those introductions has something to do with the sanctuary. What we're going to do now is study our way rapidly through these seven introductions. And we will see a fascinating pattern that has largely been missed by students of Revelation through the centuries. But once you see it, I think it will become obvious. And the exciting thing is, it is essentially the Adventist teaching on the sanctuary, but now in a New Testament book and in a New Testament setting. So fasten your seatbelts and let's begin. We'll start with Revelation 1, 12 through 20, and ask the question, what are the sanctuary images in this passage? There are several. First of all, you have seven golden lampstands. Is that a sanctuary image? Absolutely. You have one like a son of man. One like a son of man. That's a reflection of Daniel 7, uh, the end time uh, sanctuary message. And finally, this son of man wears a foot length robe with a golden sash across his chest. And scholars are agreed that this is a representation of a priest, particularly the high priest. So you have a man standing there like a son of man, dressed like a high priest, and standing among the golden lampstands. Sounds like a sanctuary image to me. All right? So you have a mix of sanctuary images. The lampstands remind us of the holy place. The son of man reminds us of the judgment, the most holy place. And the high priest could serve in either of the apartments, both the holy place and the most holy place. So what's going on here, this mix of sanctuary images? A question. Where does the scene in Revelation 1 take place? In heaven or on earth? Anyone want to guess? Many people have thought this is the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus is seen. But I'd like to suggest that it's actually on earth. You see, first of all, Jesus is seen when John is sitting on Patmos and he turns around to look behind him. And he sees Jesus among the candlesticks. So Jesus and the candlesticks are portrayed as being on Patmos with John. Those candlesticks represent the churches of Revelation in Asia Minor, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and so on. These are on earth. But most convincing of all, in Revelation 4.1, John is called up into heaven. If he's called up into heaven in chapter 4, where is he in the previous chapters? He must be on earth. So while John is in vision... This portion of the book of Revelation is taking place on earth. Now there's an interesting idea. Christ is in the sanctuary of the church. He's among the lampstands which represent the churches. Now, wait a minute. I thought that the Adventist sanctuary message is that there's a sanctuary in heaven. Now Jesus is ministering in the sanctuary of heaven. Why are you telling me here the sanctuary is the church? Is there a problem here? Let's take a closer look. You have holy place imagery, but the lampstands are the churches. It's located on earth. The high priest is involved. In the New Testament, the Greek word for sanctuary applied to the church is naos, 
naos. I'm not using the Greek letters here, using the English letters so you can pronounce it. It's naos. Naos is a term for temple or for sanctuary. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 3. Don't you know that you are the naos of God? If anyone destroys God's naos, God will destroy him. You know that text? Do you use that text to encourage people to stop smoking? Don't you know that you are God's temple, and if you destroy God's temple, God will destroy you? That's not true. Because of one little thing that's missing in most translations, the you in 1 Corinthians 3 is plural, not singular. Do you remember the context of 1 Corinthians 3? What's going on in the church of Corinth? There are factions. The church is divided into little political groups. Some are following Apollos. Some are following Peter. Some are following Paul. Some say, we follow Jesus. Those were the arrogant ones, I think. <laughs> they knew they were right. <laughs> you see, they were following Jesus. The church of Corinth was divided into factions, and Paul says, how can you do this? Don't you realize you are the temple of God? If you destroy God's temple, what's going to happen to you? You see? So for Paul, temple, naos, most holy place, is a reference to the church in 1 Corinthians 3. In 1 Peter 2, he says, you individuals are like stones that God will use to build his naos, his temple, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So you see, individual Christians are like stones in the temple, which is the church. Now that sounds a little different than what you've heard before, doesn't it? Let's be careful here. Let's look further at the text. Naos is the New Testament word for most holy place. And it's applied repeatedly to the church. How can that be? How is this appropriate to the church? Let's take a look at a text you're familiar with. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. You know that text? Have you ever quoted that text when only two or three people showed up for church? <laughs> Those small churches, you know, well, where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. And you'd be right. That's exactly what Jesus meant, but that's not all that he meant. What you may not be aware of is you can find this statement in Jewish writings whose tradition goes back before the time of Jesus. Let me share one with you. It's called Aboth 3, verse 2. Aboth means the fathers. And it's a, it's a piece of writing that records traditions that go all the way back to 300 years before the time of Jesus. And in Abo 3, 2, it says, For where two or three gather to study Torah, the Shekinah glory is in the midst. Isn't that fascinating? Jesus wasn't making it up. He was taking a statement that they were familiar with and giving it a little twist and applying it to himself. Now watch carefully what Jesus was doing. Where two or three come together in my name, and what is the equivalent in early Judaism? Where two or three gathered to study Torah. What is Jesus doing? He is putting himself in the place of Torah. And shouldn't he be the one to do that if he gave the Torah on Mount Sinai? You see? So Jesus says, everything that you see, seek for in the Old Testament applies to me. Remember that other statement? You search the scriptures looking for life, but you fail to see that they're pointing to me. So Jesus takes the place of Torah and take a look at this. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am with them. What does the original say? The Shekinah glory is in the midst. What is the Shekinah glory? 
It's the glory of God inside the temple. And Jesus says, wherever two or three gather in my name, a new temple has been created. The Shekinah glory lives in the midst. Is that exciting? You've got a little church off in the Northland, and sometimes only two or three people make it. The Shekinah glory is in the midst. If you're gathered in Jesus' name, now that's exciting. What is Jesus saying about the temple? He's saying basically, I am the Shekinah glory in the temple. Jesus is the one who is the glory of God in that temple. So what is the sanctuary in the New Testament then? What have we learned? The sanctuary in the New Testament is Jesus. Look at this text. Matthew 12, 6. Something greater than the temple is standing here. Who is standing here? Jesus. Do you know what Jews felt was greater than the temple? Only one thing. There's only one thing greater than the temple. The temple otherwise is the greatest thing. The only thing greater than the temple is the Shekinah glory inside the temple. It is the glory of God that makes the temple the dwelling place of God, that makes it great, that makes it glorious. Jesus says something greater than the temple is standing here. There's only one way they could understand that, and that is that the glory of God himself was it housed in the flesh of Jesus Christ. John 2, 19 to 21, Jesus speaks of the temple of his body. Are you beginning to see something? What is it that makes a temple a temple? The presence of God. If God lives in your heart, as is the case with Jesus, his body became a temple. If you come together in Christ's name, the Shekinah glory is in the midst. So the sanctuary in the New Testament is Jesus, but by extension, it's also wherever Jesus is. Wherever Jesus is becomes a temple because he is the very living presence of God's glory. Is there a sanctuary in heaven? Yes. Jesus is in heaven and therefore there's a sanctuary in heaven. Book of Hebrews is all about that. But is that the only sanctuary in the New Testament? No. There's a sanctuary of the church. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 Peter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Why is the church a sanctuary? Because wherever two or three gather together, Jesus is in the midst. But is that all? Is there maybe a third sanctuary in the New Testament? Hold your breath. Fasten your seatbelts. 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you know, singular, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? God dwells in us when we receive Jesus into our lives. Through the Holy Spirit, we become a temple of the living God. That's a reason why Adventists don't smoke. Health is an important factor. But even more important is the recognition of my body is the temple of God. I want to put the right kind of incense in there. Right? <laughs> Not the kind of incense that chokes the angels and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> you want to put in only the kind of incense, prayer, that uh, truly fills the temple with a sweet savor from God's perspective. So the sanctuary in the New Testament is wherever Jesus is. That's an expanded view of the sanctuary. And I want to encourage you. Don't take my word for it. If you have confidence in the readings of Ellen White, study her writings on the sanctuary and you'll discover that she has all three of these as well. These are very important in her writings, though not widely noticed uh, in the past. I first heard about it from Mervyn Maxwell. It was Uncle Arthur's nephew. And he shared Ellen White's view of these three sanctuaries. And so I was not surprised to find them in the New Testament as well. 
All right, but here's an interesting question. If Daniel says that unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed, is the end of that period in the Old Testament era or the New Testament era? If you go all the way to 1844, you're in the New Testament era, right? So what does it mean that these sanctuaries need to be cleansed? That's a tough question. And I'd like to suggest briefly tonight, because our time is short, some answers to this. What is the cleansing of the sanctuary in New Testament terms? What in heaven needs cleansing? I'd like to suggest a couple of things. Vindication of the character of God. Because of sin, because of Satan's deceptions, God's character is in, in question, in judgment. And even unfallen beings say, well, you know, we hear this word here and we hear that word here. And, you know, we trust God, kind of, but we sure would like a little more evidence that he is just. And you know what the beautiful thing of the sanctuary message here is? We serve a God with open books. See, a lot of forms of government in this world like to hide what they're doing. Hide the corruption. Hide the, uh, the graft and, and, and the hundreds of millions of dollars that they stash in Swiss banks and, and under Saddam Hussein's mattress and, and things like that, you know? Uh, the governments of this world are not usually open books. They're trying to hide the dirty stuff. But God doesn't have dirty stuff. So he opens the books. He invites his creatures. This is amazing, isn't it? He invites his creatures to examine him and pronounce judgment on him. That's amazing. The sanctuary message tells us that we serve a God with open books. We serve a God that is willing to receive our adoration willingly. He doesn't force us to worship Him. doesn't force us to believe in Him, to serve Him. But He says, look at the books. Check it out. Study me. You will find that I have been just and fair all the way through, no matter what things may have looked. A second aspect of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is vindicating our character. Now, why is that necessary? Because there's a lot of unfallen beings up there. And they want to be sure the neighborhood isn't going to go when you show up. And so there's room in the judgment for examining the characters of those who will be received into that heavenly place. You see? And so there are things that need to take place in heavenly places. These are the most important issues in the universe, the character of God and the character of the redeemed. If both of those check out, the universe can be healed of all of its uh, difficulties. What about the church? What in the church sanctuary needs to be cleansed? Any ideas coming up? How about false doctrines that make God look bad? that make God look evil. Doctrines like everlasting burning hell. You see, there are things that Christians teach that make God look bad in the secular world. Christians behave in ways that make God look bad. And God is looking for a people who will live and teach doctrines that are worthy of Him. And so, as we think of the cleansing period of earth's history, God is looking for a people who will teach, believe, and practice the things that make God look good. But there's more. What about administrative systems? I know I'm walking on some very soft ground here all of a sudden. But what about administrative systems? What is God's form of government? Open books, right? Everything open and for examination. What is the opposite of God's government? Isn't it something that's called the beast in Revelation? Isn't it a form of government where you have an absolute dictatorship, where everything is hidden? I'm not going to name any names, but sometimes children get abused in a system that is too secretive for the truth to get out. God is calling on a people who will show to the world 
a government like his. And I invite and challenge the leadership of the Adventist church to be constantly modeling itself on the government of God. And by the way, I do say it to the face as well, not just when I'm off in New Zealand and places like that. What about the body? What in the body needs to be cleansed? I'd suggest the health message is significant here. If your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, then what you put into it, how you treat it, how you behave, whether you get exercise or not, all of these things suddenly become important spiritual issues as we're seeking to glorify God in this world, to vindicate His character, to show to the world what God is like. And perhaps, just possibly, just possibly, is God looking for a people who would rather die than choose to sin, to show forth His character to the world? I've shared this with secular people. And secular people, when they hear this, say, wow, if that's what the Adventist church is all about, I'm interested. Because that sounds like as great a mission as any people could possibly have. To vindicate the character of God before the universe and before this earth, through the church. So, the key idea of the first sanctuary introduction is the idea of the church as a temple. I see some of you looking at your watch. We're not going to spend 15 minutes on each of these. But I felt that uh, as a starting point, we needed to uh, talk in general about the New Testament doctrine of the temple. Let's go to chapters 4 and 5. Here you have a thorough mix of images from the entire sanctuary. If you look through Revelation 4 and 5, you'll find a door, trumpets being blown. And in the daily service, trumpets were blown. There's a throne, perhaps representing the Ark of the Covenant. The three stones in Revelation 4 are all stones found in the high priest's breastplate. Twenty-four elders remind us that there were 24 courses of priests who served in the temple. The priests were divided into 24 groups who rotated from week to week. And in Luke 1, Zechariah's group was rotated into the temple, and that's why he was uh, ministering incense at the altar on that particular day. So the 24 elders are a sanctuary image. The lampstands in the holy place. Sea of glass may represent the laver, uh, that uh, washing bowl that was just outside the uh, tabernacle itself. But there's more. The four cherubim. Remind us that there were four cherubim in the most holy place. Two on the ark and two larger ones in Solomon's temple uh, over the ark. The calf reminds us of the sin offering. Holy, holy, holy reminds us of Isaiah's vision of the sanctuary. The lamb slain reminds us of something that happened every day in the temple. The horns on the lamb remind us of the horns on the altar. Incense took place every day in the temple. And there are priests dressed in white robes and ministering incense and so forth. Revelation 4 and 5 has more sanctuary images than any other part of the book of Revelation. There were two occasions when the whole sanctuary was involved. What were they? Two occasions when the whole sanctuary was involved. Day of Atonement? Very good. Get an A in American system. Day of Atonement and what else? The inauguration. The inauguration of the sanctuary. When the sanctuary was first dedicated, every piece of furniture, every part of the sanctuary was involved in the dedication. So there's two services where you would see every part of the sanctuary. Which of these was the case in Revelation 4 and 5? I'd like to suggest that Revelation 4 and 5 represents the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary, the founding of the sanctuary in heaven. And why would I say that and not the Day of Atonement? Because of the content of these chapters. First of all, there's a focus on the cross in Revelation 5. 
And that would seem to fit better with the inauguration of the Christian era than with its conclusion. There's a focus on intercession throughout this chapter. There's the absence of judgment language. The Day of Atonement is the time of judgment, and there's no judgment language in Revelation 4 and 5. That surprised me, by the way, uh, when I first read it in the original language. I was expecting the language of judgment. Does John know the language of judgment? Yes, he does. The second half of the book is full of it. But you won't find judgment language in Revelation 4 and 5. There's also an absence of most holy place language. John knows the most holy place. And in 1119, he uses the ark and the naos and terms like that. You won't find those terms in Revelation 4 and 5. And finally, what animal is appropriate to the Day of Atonement? The goat, the male goat. But what is the animal in Revelation 5? It is the lamb. The text doesn't say, worthy is the goat that was slain. Doesn't say that. All right? So for these reasons, it seems to me that Revelation 4 and 5 represents the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary. And that is its basic theme. So coming back to this chart that we're filling out, the first key idea is the church is a temple. The second key idea is the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary. By the way, where did the first section occur? On earth or in heaven? On earth. The second one, earth or heaven? John is called up into heaven. So we've moved from earth to heaven when we get to the second sanctuary introduction. Third, Revelation 8, 2 and 6, 2 through 6. Sanctuary images there. A golden incense altar. Incense. A censer. Censer is kind of a fire pan, like a fry pan or something, where you put the incense in and set fire to it, and then it can burn. So you have a censer. You have seven trumpets. And the focus here would be on intercession. As this incense goes up, what does it go up with in Revelation 8? The prayers of the saints. So the prayers of the saints go up, the incense mingles with it, and it comes up before God. So the focus is on God's intercession in behalf of his people and their prayers. So the key idea of this section is intercession. Then we move to Revelation eleven, nineteen. Sanctuary images in Revelation eleven nineteen. The Ark of the Covenant, the Naos, most holy place. The first reference to judgment is eleven eighteen in the book of Revelation. The first time judgment is occurring is one verse before eleven nineteen. So judgment comes in the context of the Ark and the Naos. Seems clear to me that the focus here is judgment slash day of atonement. So the key idea of the fourth introductory scene is judgment. Are you seeing something developing here? We have the inauguration of the heavenly sanctuary. We have a focus on intercession, something that begins immediately after the cross. And then you move to a focus on judgment, which would point us more toward the end time. Revelation 15, 5 through 8. Sanctuary images there. The naos, white and gold garments. Tabernacle of the testimony, which in number 17 at least is the most holy place. Inauguration language from Exodus 40 and 1 Kings 8. The naos, however, is empty during the plagues. So the temple is there, but the temple is no longer functioning when the plagues begin to fall. In other words, inauguration language is used, but the temple, which was functioning, no longer functions in chapter 15. So what you have here is a de-inauguration. The temple services come to an end in Revelation 15. So the key idea of this fifth section is de-inauguration or cessation. The temple services come to an end. 
If that's the case, what would the next one be? Let's take a look. Revelation 19. You have the following sanctuary images. The scene is clearly parallel to Revelation 4 and 5, which is a sanctuary scene. So you have worship and so forth, throne, the lamb, but no sanctuary furniture. There's no reference to a sanctuary structure or to the furnishings. In other words, the sanctuary is absent. So in Revelation 19, the sanctuary is no longer there. Worship is taking place without reference to a sanctuary. Finally, Revelation 21, you have a key verse. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. The tabernacle of God is with men. What happens in this context? The new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven to earth. You see, we've been in heaven for the last five scenes. Inauguration, intercession, judgment, de-inauguration, absence. All of those scenes taking place in heaven. Now we come back to earth with the new Jerusalem. and It says the tabernacle of God is with men. God himself will be with them. Notice the sanctuary images in this section. Tabernacle, New Jerusalem. I'd like to suggest the New Jerusalem is the most holy place. Why? Because there's only two perfect cubes in the Bible. The most holy place and the New Jerusalem. The only cubes you'll find in the Bible equal in height, width, and uh, length. The radiance of the new Jerusalem reminds us of the Shekinah glory. There's no need for sun or moon or stars. Why? Because God himself is the light of the city. The Shekinah glory provides its light. And the foundation of the city is 12 stones, which are found on the high priest's breastplate. So the new Jerusalem is a sanctuary image. And the Lamb is its lamp. In 22.3, it says that the inhabitants of the city offer sacrificial service to God. It uses a special Greek word, sacrificial service to God. It is sanctuary message here in the New Jerusalem. In Revelation 1, Jesus is among the candlesticks. God is with us in a spiritual sense, as he is today. But in Revelation 21 and 22, God becomes a literal presence. They will see his face. You see, the sanctuary message applies both places. But there's an advancement when you get to the New Jerusalem. What was spiritual becomes literal. In both cases, the sanctuary is on the earth. It is the restoration of Eden. You have the tree of life. You have the waters coming from the throne. It's the fulfillment of Exodus 25. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. We'll illustrate this in a moment. You have the following key ideas in the book of Revelation. The church is a temple. At the bottom, the city is the temple. What is the bride of the Lamb? Is it the city or is it the people? It's both. In chapter 19, the bride is the people. In chapter 21, the bride is the city. The new Jerusalem is the bride of the Lamb because it's filled with the redeemed. In between the church as temple and the city as temple are five scenes of the heavenly sanctuary. So you have a movement from earth to heaven to earth. And what you have in the middle here is a history of the heavenly sanctuary in the course of the Christian era. The kind of information that we've looked for in the Old Testament was right there under our noses in the book of Revelation. God inaugurates the sanctuary, begins with intercession, 
And toward the end of the Christian era, intercession becomes also judgment. And we'll have more to say about judgment in the next several nights. So a movement from inauguration to intercession to judgment to cessation to absence. We can illustrate the same thing vertically, where John is on Patmos when he experiences the first scene. In chapter 4, he's called up into heaven, and there you have the heavenly sanctuary, inauguration, intercession, judgment, cessation, absence. Then the new Jerusalem comes down in 21.3, and the tabernacle is once again on the earth. This is the explicit pattern of the sanctuary in the book of Revelation. It's one last thing I want to share with you tonight. Revelation portrays the fulfillment of Exodus 25, 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Remember I said that the book of Revelation, the sanctuary in Revelation, offers the big picture of salvation? Watch very carefully. The Garden of Eden, before sin. There in the Garden of Eden, God and humanity were together in the garden. There was no veil between. There was no sin to prevent relationship. God and the human race had a perfect relationship. That's how the Bible story begins. But what goes wrong? In Genesis chapter 3, sin comes in, and now what happens? You have God in the garden and humanity outside. There's a barrier. God and the human race are separated by sin. So it's a serious problem. What is God going to do about it? Exodus 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And so they build the sanctuary in the center of the camp, and God lives inside the sanctuary. Humanity is still outside the sanctuary. So what is the difference? The difference is this. Through the priests, the people have representative access to God. Every day, priests go in in behalf of the people into the holy place. Once a year, the high priest goes into the very presence of God. So the sanctuary is an advance in that God is dwelling among them and allowing access through the priests to him. Revelation chapter 1, the church on earth. Notice what has happened here. The church is now represented by what? The lampstands. Where are the lampstands? In the holy place. Where is the holy place? Just across the curtain from God's presence. You see, through Jesus Christ, representatively, the church is now ascended to heaven and is close to God. There, in Revelation 1. Physically, we are not together with God, but spiritually, we have been drawn through Christ close to the heart of God. Ephesians 2 says we are in heavenly places in Christ. We have representative access in Christ. I know that my priest is right there at the right hand of God. And he understands me because he's human as well. So we now are even closer to God than before. But there's still a not yet. We aren't face to face with God just yet. And in Revelation 21 and 22, in the new earth, the Garden of Eden is restored. In the new Jerusalem, God and humanity are back together again. That's the big picture. Ruin and restoration. Perfection at the beginning, sin comes in. Through the sanctuary, God gradually draws the human race back to himself. Heaven comes to earth in the sanctuary of the new Jerusalem. The most holy place is now not just the dwelling place of God, but it's also the dwelling place of his people who are with God face to face. Garden of Eden is restored. And that's the message of the sanctuary in the book of Revelation. The sanctuary takes us from Eden to Eden. It takes us 
from the cross to the new Jerusalem. The sanctuary is the big picture of a God who loves us so much that he will do whatever it takes to bring us back to himself. Through intercession, we are acceptable to God even though we stumble, even though our vessels are not perfect. We are acceptable to God through the intercession of Christ. And tomorrow, we want to talk about the judgment. One reason that many people have shied away from historic Adventism is they fear the judgment. They fear that somehow in the judgment the gospel is being undermined. I want to show you tomorrow night that the gospel and the judgment have one and the same message. You don't need to be afraid of the judgment. If you are one with Jesus Christ, you will make it through the judgment. I want to show you biblically through texts, Old Testament and New Testament texts, how the gospel is exalted by the judgment rather than undermined by the judgment. Shall we stand as we close with prayer tonight? Lord, I thank you tonight that you have made a way through the sanctuary back to yourself. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to see how simple the path, how clear the way. May none of us turn away from that way, but shall we seize it and rejoice in it and walk in it and lead others to walk in that path for Jesus' sake. Amen.